Tonight on the Cool Wall, I try to go to Narnia. <laughs> Ow! <laughs> Found a cycling reveals his man crushes. You know, Graham Aubrey, uh, uh, Dan Bingham, Bingham and uh, Ronan McLaughlin. You know, they and Hambini tells us where he gets his cocaine. No, I get the uh, the stuff from uh, a place in Sheffield, um, the billets. And welcome to another episode of the Shite and Sarcasm Engineering Show. In today's episode, a bit of a different one, we've got on the right hand side of my screen representing, I don't know what kind of haircut that is, PT, who's ultimate sarcasm and boyish good looks and all that. And unfortunately, he's very popular with the HR department at where I work, even though they are full of men. And on the left, we have. <laughs> Joe from China Cycling, who is one of the ba basic corporate shill bags for, you know, just being a corporate shill bag. And um, just here, we have the... <laughs> that's product placement. Do we have to hit that button that says this is a product placement? I don't think so. Anyway, and over here, we have the engineer that everyone loves to hate. Yes, yours truly, the favourite five-year-old. Right, I will hand over to uh, to Joe, who's actually editing this today. Yeah, so apologies for the crap edit in advance. Uh, anyway, yes, we are back with another episode of The Cool Wall. Uh, in case you somehow missed the first episode, um, the basic premise is we all pitch some ideas and then discuss amongst ourselves whether or not they are cool. They may be cycling related, they may not, they may be interesting, they may be boring. Basically just three middle-aged men having a fucking circle jerk and trying not to come across as... What was the last comment we got under the last one? We were, we were... It wasn't elitist. It was... What was the word? I can't remember. There were many. Yeah, there were many. People weren't happy, Many derogatory terms. terms. Obtuse, Anyways, obtuse, obtuse little, little men. Sad little, little men. Sad old, old men. men. <laughs> yeah. But... Bring it. The last, the last one was alcohol-infused, and maybe that was the cause. So today, the alcohol has been switched. We've been banned from the... Banned from the alcohol and back on the energy drinks. It's, it's all, all caffeine, caffeine today, today for me. Yeah, all, ca all caffeine. <laughs> right. Shall, I, shall, I, shall we go for it? Yeah. So yeah. from last time, the wall was left with some seriously uncool stuff, some cool stuff, some sub-zero stuff, not much in the uncool territory. Is there anything we need to address, boys? What Has anyone have a uh, peak talk? Have you had a revelation? Have you found roof racks are finally interesting? <laughs> Fuck no, I think they're still shit uh, and they'll destroy your bike. And now everyone's got an e-bike. You can't actually reliably put them on any roof racks because they're too heavy. So they're still shit. People are still driving cars that are too big and they can actually fit them in the back. And we said last time that cyclists aren't going to reproduce because you're a cyclist and you're probably not going to get laid. So no reason in the world for a bike on the roof. Um, I still think the Trek ISO speed on the Madonna Sub-Zero and it's even cooler now. So you might even want to shift that a little bit further to the right because the new one is absolutely fucked. Like they don't have the decoupler, they've just got a gaping vagina in the seat tube, which does nothing. And some marketing department has claimed it's for aerodynamics. So it actually makes the old one even cooler because you can't get it anymore. So I think Trek ISO speed on the Madone. Yeah, it's unobtainium, basically because they're not selling it anymore. And I think they had quite a lot of warranty issues on it. So you probably, probably can't get one anyway. Um, so move that up a bit. Roof racks stay where they are. Uh, I don't know what you think about disc brakes, Joe. Hambini, you've still got my hair in uncool, seriously uncool territory. Gravel everything. I think that can stay there. But I think Zwift, Zwift, I think last time we agreed that was cool. I've changed my mind on that. Um, I can't really describe why, but I think you might, Joe, have some more info for that. On that, well, for us on that yeah i think before we we're all happy that you know swift was i think the consensus was it's getting more people on bikes and you know making people thinner and yay aren't they a do-goody company but these days it seems they're not so much a do-goody company as they've decided to uh well they brought out their own trainer right which on the surface is a 
a great thing for everyone. Yay, there's a new trainer coming out. But in the process, they have totally effed their hardware partners. Partners, sorry. Ooh, so pre- previously, juicy. Ooh, ooh. the likes of Wahoo and uh, TACX or whoever else is making hardware, like, you know, they have a one chance to get money out of your wallet, right, when you buy the hardware. And then after that, it's, it's Uncle Zwift's turn to come around your house and start milking you every, every, every month for your $15 or whatever. Uh, but now Zwift has decided it wants the big payment up front as well, so it's going to start doing the hardware. And uh, because it knows it can get the money from monthly subscriptions later, it's came in with a very aggressive pricing for their new their own trainer. And uh, this has really upset their, their, part, uh, their partners, let's say, uh, of Wahoo and TACX and these guys to the point where Wahoo has even sued them for the design of their nice. smart trainer. So this nice. smart trainer, Jealousy. yeah, this smart trainer was previously sold by a company called Jet Black for like over a year, and Wahoo didn't didn't touch them because you know they thought whatever, you do your thing, I do my thing, we all make money, happy days. But then Zwift slaps a Zwift logo on it and brings it out super cheap, undercutting. Uh, Wahoo undercutting TACX, undercutting everyone, and uh, yeah, no more money to be made for those guys. So Wahoo gets the lawyers out, sends them knocking on Zwift's store, and uh, yeah, we'll see how that ends up. But yeah, things are not nice now between the Zwift and the uh, hardware partners. There's talks that people are going to start banning other people's trainers from the platform because they already have this like you know circle jerk thing. Uh, what you, what do you think, Alex? What is the lawsuit about? Uh, so Being they, successful? Like, uh, <laughs> they claim it... In, in maybe this is the plan all payment. along? Well, okay. Yeah. What, on the, on, the, on the hardware side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Wahoo, fine. Wahoo, uh, maybe there has, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I assume Wahoo has a nice bunch of patents about hardware design. But so before, Zwift was already putting things in place to set up this elitist, like, circle jerk where... If you want to go racing on Zwift, you have to use special trainers that they've approved. And this was one way for them to do gatekeeping. But now they're doing their own hardware. You know, they can start dropping other brands of being approved trainers, yada, yada, yada. So uh, what the other trainer, what the, these hardware manufacturers are going to do about it, we shall see. But uh, yeah, I definitely mm. think not cool by Zwift. Not cool at all. Yeah, I mean, so on the surface, it's good for consumers because people are getting cheaper trainers. But if their plan is to set get everyone else out of business and then start jacking prices back up, uh, that's not going to be good for consumers in the long run. Yeah? So on the short term, everyone thinks it's good that Swift's bringing out a cheaper trainer. But their strategy is to kill the competition and then have a mon- monopoly. And uh, historically, that doesn't usually end well for consumers. So Swift, sorry, you're going into uncool. Well, I think from a commercial perspective, I think it could be just pure genius because yeah. you could end up <laughs> you could you could end up turfing all the other ones out because Zwift have paid all that money to develop Watupia World or whatever the fuck it's called. Um, I don't I don't go on Zwift. Um, I don't know. Whatever. It's like yeah. it's like Ormskirk's Red Light District or whatever tour you want to do. Fucking this week. <laughs> Going back to what I was on about, it could be commercial genius because they could just end up controlling the entire market from the point where you buy it to the point where you finish with it. And you've um, you've, you've got, you know, the difference is it's software as a service, almost that kind of business model for Zwift. Um, but for, for, you know, Garmin, who own tax, I think, and um, Wahoo... Once you bought the hardware, that's mm. it. Game over, isn't it? Yeah. You haven't got that that income afterwards. And how often do you change turbo trainers? Exactly. Once you've got it, that's probably three or four years until the bearings get fucked. Mm. I'm with Zwift. I'm I'm with Zwift on this one. I'm with Zwift on this one. Actually, yeah. I mean, how can you expect to sell a product that essentially is supposed to last a long time just with hardware and not any? I mean, Wahoo have got some very, very, very basic software overlay for, for training programs, I think, when they, when you buy a, a trainer. But without a software as a service on top of that, like, you really, how, how do you expect to stay in the game? Just selling hardware, you just can't, you just can't. I mean, what kind of a name is fucking Wahoo? What? What? It's, 
Who <laughs> seriously <laughs> named that company <laughs> Wahoo? <laughs> Who gets on their turbo trainer at home in front of their wife and kids and goes, Wahoo? <laughs> That's fucking stupid. Look at me, honey. I'm oh, a Wahoo again. Joe, but do what you like cool. with it. You, you you brought it up. You can you can you can have the final say on that one. But this is this is gatekeeping, guys. Not gatekeeping. Housekeeping. housekeeping. We need to move on. We shall see. Yeah, we'll see what happens next week. Anyway, moving yeah. on in tonight's show. Uh, let's start with the first new addition to the cool wall. Uh, this was put forward as a suggestion: boutique cycle shop mechanics. Uh, Oh, yes. This one was mine. Yes. Okay, then you have the floor. This one was mine. Right. Well, let me tell you a story. So, a guy who claims to be a sci-tech or crap-tech qualified mechanic, for those of you not watching in the UK, that is a qualification that's somewhere above being able to read and use a screwdriver... <laughs> Um, went to uh, oh, oh God. Well, went, and, went and gave me a call last week and said dear Hambini you fucking stupid twat I've put this bottom bracket into a, a, a bike frame and this guy works at a place called Gamma let's call it Gamma okay <laughs> Greek letter anyway you'll figure it out I can see yeah, some I puzzled think, faces I'm thinking uh, of it uh, it's not helpful. Uh, oh, I've got it. It's that very established <laughs> anyway. shop in uh, Surrey, isn't it? In Hampton Wick. Well, you, you used to live near there, I think. I think I did. Anyway, yeah. uh, uh, good hairdressers, as we go up, off topic slightly. Turkish barbers, mate, can't go wrong. Fuck's sake. <laughs> anyway, so this guy rings me up and, and he says, I've put the bottom bracket into the bike frame and now it doesn't spin at all. So um, I asked him if he'd, if he'd measured the bike frame and he said, oh, no, no, it's a bike frame made by company XYZ in Italy. It fucking well isn't. It's made yeah. somewhere else. Just badged uh, with a painted wherever in Italy. Um, and uh, it, it transpired after all this went through that he basically hadn't measured the hole. The hole was out and the bearing clearance was... Uh, 0.12 millimeters of crush. So normally you'd have a, a bearing clearance of about 0.02 as an interference fit, and 0.12, so it was a 48.88 hole in a 41 nominal. It's just outrageous. So my entrant into the call wall for being a twat are boutique cycling mechanics. I think they should be seriously uncool. I hand it over. What do you, what do you reckon? Mr. Peaky? Uh, well, I've worked in a few bike shops in my time, and I know, kind of know what you mean. Um, although Harry, my last bike shop mechanic, he was a legend, and he was not, he was the most unboutique guy you'd ever meet, so kudos to Harry, he knew what he was doing. But I know what you mean, they, they tend to have a, a familiar look about them, I am stereotyping completely, but they were, a plaid shirt and they always have a little hipster kind of tash with curled up ends that are kind of gelled up like this and maybe they have some sort of round French baker glasses on and uh, I think they know fucking everything and really they don't know their way around the tool set like yeah our uncle that's what I'm going to say you've just caused a, a horde of mechanics to go shave off their moustaches for fear of being persecuted by their customers tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, uh, most of them don't even get seen because they're hidden away in the workshop, right? so they literally don't face the customers, right? They bitch about the customers, but they never face the customers, which I funny, think I'm... is the hardest part of working in a bike shop is dealing with people. Like being in the workshop, you, you hide it. Yeah, you, let's let's be fair. Bike mechanics are underpaid, like massively underpaid, considering the shit now they have to work on. Like the quality of bikes has got reduced I would say the issues that the bike mechanics are dealing with now they probably don't have to deal with 10 20 years ago with all the fucking integrated cabling and all this shit setting up electronic gears bleeding disc brakes there was none of that shit all you have to do is put a new like brake cable in um, maybe grease up the square taper bottom bracket and the bike was out of the door in half an hour whereas now like they have to deal with absolute crap that's wait we just said absolute crap we can come on to them in a minute but 
the stuff they're dealing with, they don't get paid enough to deal with that. And they get so much pressure from customers. Why isn't my bike ready? Oh, I'm doing the Etat du Tour next week. Did you know last year I did an Ironman? By the way, I need this done by Friday. All these fucking tough wankers that come in and just bring their S-Works in with no idea, no fucking idea how long these things take. And they, they do get a hard time, okay? Fair enough. But you do get your fair share of pricks in, in the bike mechanic area. And yeah, I'm cool. Yeah, I'm gonna say I'm not qualified to have an opinion. Like in, in my life, I think I've been to one bike shop uh, in the West because uh, back in the UK I never used to cycle I only cycle in China so the one bike shop I've been in mm. the UK like uh, I didn't deal with a mechanic either so I'll hand over to your expertise but one thing I will say like uh, you know Hanbini is not a fan of this guy because he didn't measure the hole before installing the BB but like is that his fault or is that the bike manufacturer's fault like if I imagine you know the the Honda service guys they don't measure the spark plugs before they put them in the engine like they assume that fucking someone made the hole the right size and <laughs> someone made the thread the right size like I don't know if it's a if it should be a prerequisite that you have to measure a fucking hole or it's safe to assume it's the right size but uh, I guess the world we live in is you know we all know that what would you say have been how many how on average what percentage of bike frames would you say have an out of spec uh, bottom bracket hole. Um, I'd probably say thirty percent at least. Yeah. So in that, if that's the at situation, least. then yeah, I think measuring should be something that they're doing, right? Well, the, the the argument is, you see, it's all about quality control. So when the bike left the factory, it obviously wasn't checked. So the, the thing's out of spec. Now it's arrived at the uh, competent cycling mechanic who works in the boutique factory, uh, boutique shop. He should be measuring it as well as part of his quality check, yeah. and he hasn't done it. So he's no better than the, uh, you know, the, the twats from, uh, from Italy. But there needs to be something in the Cytec syllabus. I mean, I don't know what it is, but I kind of had a, a brief detailing of what it was probably about five years ago, but there needs to be something in the SciTech syllabus to deal with the absolute junk that we get given in, the, in, in terms of frames and stuff. Because, yeah, there needs to be something, when you, get, when you get a new bike in the door, first thing you do, every fucking bike shop should have a proper ball gauge, like a Mitch Toyo ball gauge. It should be part of the workshop tools. Measure the bottom bracket. The bottom bracket or headset is not up to spec. That's as far as it goes. The bike doesn't get built because that bike's just gonna come back time after time with an angry customer. And that needs to go into the whole like, education process of mechanics. And traditionally it hasn't been in there. And that's something that needs to change. And the other thing I was gonna add is, you know, some of the, some insurance claims I, I am expert witness for, um, where there's been an issue with um, a faulty frame, then the frame manufacturer has, has been brought to task, but also the bike shop. So in the case where PT mentioned the headset, a headset, the, basically the fork, is a very vulnerable part of the bike because it's at the front and it's not very well supported. If that bearing seat in there is loose, then you've got the, the quality control from the original manufacturer mm. and you've got the bike shop. So both of those become liable for it. So, and that's yeah, so, yeah, that's so it, common with the, the bearing seats becoming loose. And I think, uh, I think a lot of the manufacturers, because they're using kind of the integrated tapered um, bearings, they, they have this a little bit naive assumption that actually the cups don't need to be that well aligned because because of the tapers, it, it's kind of self-aligned. Which yeah. to some extent it is, but we now see, um, this problem more and more common. And I think it's to do with to do with having disc brakes on the front because the the kind of aft force with a disc brake or the transient forces are a lot higher than they could be with a rim brake, whether you like it or not. And that will show up like a clunk in that headset. So although they might be self-aligning when you do the preloader, sometimes that braking force is enough to actually overcome that that fit in the two bearing seats. And the bearing the bearings do clunk. And I've had that on the last two out of three disc brake bikes I've owned. Um, whether, you know, whether the actual cones of the bearings have been concentric, they may be, but at some point you're gonna overcome that friction and then you need to have the bearing tight in the seat and the bearing seats just aren't tight enough. 
I'm, I'm pretty curious what's happening. Like, so all of these big brands, uh, most of the time we're seeing, like when someone buys a complete bike, it, it usually rides pretty well, like off the showroom, right? But when we have a look at the frames, the frames are shit. So what happens is most of these brands, they all ship their frames uh, over to Taiwan. And that's where these big assembly plants are, where, you know, uh, loads of companies, loads of brands in the same fact, in the same big assembly line are assembling all the complete bikes. I'm really curious as to what, like, goods in QC or like goods in Fettling, these assembly plants are doing like, cause they must get the same dog of frames that, that consumers are getting, but they must be doing so much to make it. So when they leave the shop floor, they're rideable, right? So I wonder if they're, you know, mm. they're Fettling BBs themselves or they're making custom bottom brackets or whatever. Cause yeah. you know, I, I see it a lot on Habini's channel, right? You have guys who've had a bike that has been going all right, but then when they come to change the bottom bracket or they come to change them up, that's when they, the, you know, you find out it's all gone to ship. So yeah, I'm really curious what's going on over there. Uh, just, just to wrap it up, I think the last couple of years has been particularly bad in terms of QC problems. And I've said this before in my own videos is that during your, you know initial lockdowns of COVID, the bike, the demand for bikes just went through the roof. Everyone's going off grid a bit more. Everyone's working from home. People want to exercise. Bike, you know, you couldn't sell enough bikes. There was a massive shortage. There still is. So the Western manufacturers or the Western marketing companies of bikes um, are demanding more production from the factories in China or Taiwan, whatever it is. But for the last two or three years, no Western engineers or QC checkers have been over to China because they don't want to travel there. Of maybe the zero COVID policy, things are still quite hard for foreigners to come into China. So they're relying on the Chinese factory to ship as many frames as they want which, you know, the, the pressure from the Western company is huge to just get shipments up and up and up. Um, but there's no QC done. And it's not in the, you know, when, when the Chinese factory has been pressured so hard to ship, uh, you know, an allotment or ship a quantity of frames, are they going to go through everything with a fine tooth comb and say, actually, we can't ship you 50. We're 50 short of this shipment because of QC rejects. No, of course not. They just fucking send the whole lot and deal with it later. That's why in a couple of years, time we'll get all the repercussions for all these shit frames going back now and then the next like three or four or five years is going to be so messy for bad qc in the bike industry because you've got those three years of lockdown production where nothing's been checked and the demand's been huge and it's going to be the worst worst to come yet i think yeah i agree entirely uh, especially what you said about like uh the western engineers who you know designed the frames or we design the bikes haven't been able to come over it's quite funny there's a factory around here which i, sh I won't name uh, but the factory's rear gate uh i made a strava segment outside the rear gate and so i can see uh i can see who's, who's going the factory in. all the time yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fuck if, you, if you look on this strava segment uh <laughs> and look at the years like so from 2012 to 2019 it's all americans and all uh names from Taiwan, blah, 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 blah. But then after that, it just all goes to simplified Chinese names, like lo local names. Like, uh, so yeah, um, I'm, I'm not saying engineer countries from engineer Y are better than engineers from country X, but if the guy who designed it can't go to the factory, of course you're gonna mm. have issues, right? We should get you a stalking certificate. Mm. That's impressive. Hey. That is impressive. Yeah. I like that, I'm gonna have to use that. Doesn't right. Get what, what were we even talking about? We, we've gone off on a tangent from mechanics. boutique cycle shop mechanics. So, are you going to drop those in <laughs> on the board? You choose. And Beanie, where, where do you want them to go? On cool. On cool. Right. Can't uncool. go anywhere else. Dynamic policy. Else. Maybe they can redeem themselves if they start measuring shit. Okay. Then the next one's going to get us in a bit of hot water, I think. Weight weenies. Bring it. Bring Weight it, weenies, boys. What do we think? Is weight wieners cool or uncool? I assume we're talking about the forum and not. Are we talking about the forum or the people who. No. Oh, shit. See, I thought we were talking is, about the forum. <laughs> it's, it's, it's our weight weenies uncool, not is. So I'm talking about these militants that fucking populate the forum. Nothing wrong with the forum. I think it's quite a nice place to read about new stuff. I mean, I go on there as a stalker, I don't have a profile, or do I? Wait, wait. Um, but yeah, fucking hell, the militants of some of these wankers, which are literally never going to pull their finger out of their pocket and actually buy something. They're just on there to destroy someone 
or on there to make fun or pick apart. Like anything new that's launched is attacked by armchair engineers on weight weenies. And sometimes it gets a little bit personal and the moderators have to step in. And when you see that, like for someone who's just trying to, you know, make a buck, make a dollar, set up a business, do something different. It's fucking sad, man. Like, who are these low life wankers? Like you see people on there asking for manufacturers to disclose potentially sensitive IP. And why should they do that to some, you know, anonymous prick on weight weenies is never gonna fucking buy the products. Like, I think weight weenies, people, not all of them, but I am generalizing. So all of them are seriously uncool. Anyone else? <laughs> well, well, I was famously banned from there. I can't remember Good. which person I slagged off, but anyway, I haven't really <laughs> Maybe missed Maybe you're much. one of the people um, I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, well. Probably. I think they, they banned my three IPs that I have, and I'm not intelligent enough to have a VPN, so I'm oh, fucked in that regard. Uh, um, this is a good time to talk about this video sponsor. No, I'm joking. <laughs> This video is not VPN. sponsored. No, don't mention any names. Surfshark. You're not sponsored. Surfshark, if you're, not, if you're up for paying us 10p per minute, you can get on this video. Uh, Surfshark I mean, and yeah, NordVPN are shit. Like, they're both shit. I've tried them. I can't watch any of my dodgy ladyboy porn on, on Surfshark or VPN. I've, tr I've tried. The only one that works is Express. For the real dark shit, the only one that works is ExpressVPN. And they don't have to go and slagging them, slutting themselves off on fucking YouTube, low rent YouTube promotions. They just, yeah, they just know they work, so they don't need it. So I like ExpressVPN. Cheers. What Expensive, kind of, but it works. What, what kind of a wanker would take a NordVPN or a Squarespace sponsorship from? <laughs> oh, sorry. I, I think Hambini's <laughs> already done Squarespace. It's where he learned how to do Squarespace. his fucking VBA code or something. Oh no, that Skill, was, um, Skillshare, that one. Skillshare. Skillshare, yeah, yeah. Skillshare. Maybe we could get yeah, no, no one. Yeah. No, no one spotted in that Skillshare in those adverts that I went looking for hairdressers in their Skillshare uh, <laughs> in catalog. No one spotted it. Maybe you could get Unreal. the cycle uh, boutique cycle shop mechanics to do some Skillshare tutorials on how to measure things. Oh. Yeah. Weight weenies, yeah. I mean, the thing with weight weenies is you've got a load of people who, you know, have completely diverse backgrounds that are sort of un unverifiable making comments, um, trying to extract information out of various other people. And uh, I mean, what PT said is correct. I mean, they, they come along and ask me for, you know, dimensions for things of bottom brackets and how I go about making them. I'm not going to give that away because yeah. it's, you know, it's just stupid. So, Absolutely. If there's a, uh, a point which is worse than seriously uncool, let's have them in there. Fuck that. Get them really? in there. Get them in there. Yeah. Than seriously Twats. uncool. Get Joe. them in there. Joe, any ideas before we move on? Because we've got a lot to get through. Uh, so yeah, weight weenies. Uh, it, I think it's a it's a love it or hate it place, right? Uh, so back in the day when I first started my pimping game here at Windspace, there was a there was a thread. <laughs> I'm not sure you're allowed to say that these days, Joe. Uh, we might have the woke brigade coming after you. Sorry. Okay. Fuck them. There was a there was a thread made about the hyper wheels on weight wieners, and uh, because back in the day there weren't that many people knowing about us, like I was in there every day checking for replies and replying and blah 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 blah. But like you say, like it just goes into it turns into such a rabbit hole and turns into such a a, a witch hunt, right? Like, uh, you know. You, you, you try you try to be nice to everyone and answer all the questions, but at the same time, you don't want to you know put all your secrets out there for everyone to see. Like like you said, so yeah, I think back in the day there were some industry in insiders on there, uh, you know, some people who actually knew the stuff. But after being like trolled or like witch hunted, I think yeah. everyone, most of the people on there now. Again, we're not generalizing. Most of the people on there now are just elbow licking cretins. So. <laughs> I remember, I remember there was a, um, I mean, love him or hate him, I don't know much about the guy, but someone called Damon Reinard from Cervelo. Uh huh. Uh huh. I think he used. I think that's his name. I think I remember quite a lot of controversy when he was on there. And he, to be fair, he was quite open and and honest about stuff they were doing and stuff they were testing. But I think in the end, the trolls just got him, and 
it's the same with everyone else in the industry. Like the trolls just come fighting and there's no back, like they just don't back down. So why would you have any commercial sense on being public on a forum like that? I just think it's toxic. Like it's only going to end badly. If you, if you're a business owner and you're on there engaging with fucking trolls, like what are you going to get out of it? Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you reckon specialized would go on there? No. Uh, maybe that's the genius. I mean, they, though, right? they have, they probably have many people on there as, you know, as, as commenters and, um, just part of the, part of the big plan. So I don't know. Yep. So yeah, we'll seriously go uncool. for, <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to go, I'm going to go border seriously uncool and uncool because when you oh, are I... sometimes, when you're sometimes Googling, you know, some problem that you're having with compatibility between some super old crank and some super newish power meter or whatever, like you can occasionally find the answer in a weight weenus forum. So like, I think it's saved my bacon a few times. All right. All right. It's got some use. Seriously, uncle? Uh, I'll go with that. Uh, okay. Let's move on. Moving on. Well, it's pretty uncool today, isn't it? We're in a bad mood. Well, this one, this one will be better. I, I have a feeling you two will both be optimistic about this next one. I'm going to say it's uncool, and we'll see where you two go with it. People putting PowerPoint presentations in a YouTube video. Like, <laughs> uh, what? I, I went, like, what? Uh, I don't even know why. Uh, I can't even defend it. Sorry. You, you guys tell me why it's cool then, I guess. Well, for a start, Joe, the cool wall that you're actually editing and putting in this video right now, I made that in PowerPoint. So, end of story. Shit. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> I've lost. You fucked yourself. Is the cool wall cool? Anyway. Oh, yeah. This could be like Inception, couldn't it? You could have cool wall in cool wall in cool wall in cool wall. Oh, there we go. Uh, but yeah, I'm just going to say, like, you know, PowerPoints are like the most depressing thing the world has ever given to us like it's either when you're a student and some lecturer who's you know do doesn't know more than you is going through slide by slide and just reading what's on every page instead of just you know actually doing his job or it's just the bane of every meeting where you're just biting on your own tongue trying to commit suicide like it's the most depressing software in the world and to put it in a youtube video I, like you know, you watch all these things about how to get more views on YouTube and how to make an interesting video. I know. Yeah, I'm do the put opposite. PowerPoint in it. Yeah. Well, would it would it help if it was something like, uh, oh, what's the what's the hipster version of PowerPoint? The one that comes on Mac. Is it called One OneNote or something? Uh, Keynote or some bullshit? Mac. Would it help if you did, if I use something like that or something trendy like Canva that was woke and looked nice? I think you just need a giant, time, a giant what, whiteboard Joe, behind it. I'm going to use one of those, the old school lecturing devices, the massive like light bulb thing projector with the scrolly, the with the scrolly, yeah, OHP with a little Stadler pen. That's what you want, Thank isn't you. it? Yeah, they will. Yeah. The pen will be working. And it shakes. It shakes when the, the lecturers have too much coke. You shake in, and the whole thing's shaking. There yeah. we go. There we go. Well. Uh, well, as the as the proponent of uh, PowerPoint in uh, in cycling videos, I, I maybe should step in here and say it's way off the scale in Sub Zero because I think, I think so. if, because let's 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 be honest, PowerPoint has become cool and there's a lot more visibility in cycling circles because of two engineers on here who basically use it as a piss taking tool. It's it's not there for you know to make it dull and boring. I mean, who else has the shitbag scale of engineering fuckwitism and the uh, the cool wall itself all on PowerPoint? If if we went the other way, we could have some shitty graphics from the likes of. Can we slag off anybody? Are we naming names? Can we do that? Yeah. Fuck it, GCN or yeah. or or other magazine shows or sorry, advertising channels are available with flashy graphics, but you learn nothing. Whereas people tune in to watch PT's, um, you know, PowerPoints of his, his bearing preload, of which he put that PowerPoint out, and then he doesn't. I don't even need a bell icon because every fucker on the planet goes, "Have you seen PT's PowerPoint presentation <laughs> no, on bearing loads?" Well, that's it. Then so you know, ten or twelve emails pointing at that. It's just cool. Uh, sorry, super cool. 
Take sub it over. zero. Fuck it. Take it over. Well, I mean, that's sub zero. And Joe, let me raise my hand. If if I didn't use PowerPoint, I would have to hire one of those GCN dudes to come and fucking sit in my living room whilst I'm editing the video. And I definitely don't want anyone from GCN in my house, particularly not one that has a plaid shirt and the little fucking hips to tap. <laughs> and I'd have to pay them. I'd have to pay them. I'd have to give them like compassionate leave when their dog like decided it was vegan and stuff. Fuck that. I'll do it myself on PowerPoint. <laughs> mm. Some of the some of the diagrams I've seen Hambini knock up in PowerPoint. It like it borders on impressive. Like, you know, I, I, I assume <laughs> Dr. Hambini is well versed in many technical drawing softwares. Uh, and yet he can he can sketch probably... one of them. <laughs> no. <laughs> but some of the things he knocks up in PowerPoint is uh yeah. I think my two my two year old daughter could give him a run for his money. You should you should see some of the things he knocks up in real life, mate. Fucking disgusting. Oh, oh. Well, okay. Oh dear. I think, I think I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna have to receive this one to you too. Well, seriously, seriously, sub zero. I stand corrected. I stand corrected. Sub zero Power, PowerPoint presentations in YouTube videos are sub zero. <sighs> we're at, we're we're absolutely polar on this call, well, aren't we? There's not much kind of lingering in the middle today. There's, uh, it's one end or the other. Well, let's put it out to let's put it let's put it out to the audience, um, and they can we'll put it somewhere. Joe, you can decide where it goes, and then the audience can comment, and then next time we'll we'll maybe slide it slide it down or up. Okay, okay. So PowerPoint in YouTube for now. Sub zero. I don't have any alternatives. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Okay, moving swiftly on. Okay, next one may be a subject of controversy. Uh, we're going ad hominem on this one. We're going, we're taking it personal, but it's a guy with thick skin, and I'm sure he'll be in the comments down below. So, everyone's favorite YouTuber, Durian Ryder. Cool or uncool? Cool, definitely cool. He's definitely cool. The reason is he's not afraid to put it out there and then get a uh, torch for it. And he's just, you know, even if you threw petrol over him, he wouldn't catch fire. He'd be made of asbestos because he's, <laughs> he's just completely immune to everything. I so agree. cool. That's it. That's it. Cool. I mean, the roasting he did of that other, let's call it cycling journalist in, in the video, <laughs> video about the Bianchi bike where he was going on about gaping. Oh my word. I've never, I've never heard so much, so much fun. In my life, it was just hilarious. It was like, gape, gape. <laughs> so it rhymes with something else. But anyway, we'll carry on. <laughs> we'll have to drop in cool. a little clip of that. We'll, we'll drop in a little clip of that said video <laughs> on the screen somewhere. Um, Durian Ryder pro probably won't be suing us for copyright infringement. So he won't mind if we drop in that clip. <laughs> and that's how the cycling industry gets away with selling junk to people. is because these mainstream media people just bend over and say, so, yeah, how much? They just get their cheeks gaping. The specialized put that, you know, 12 inch in there. As long as there's a few hundreds in the end, we're good to go. Yeah, I think, I think Duran Ryder is a, a, a controversial fellow, let's say. Uh, I think he's openly admitted to juicing before, you know. Uh, he's, 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 uh, he's experimented in some uh, Dr. Ferrari style training. Uh, definitely a controversial guy. Some of some of his advice, uh, yeah. How many YouTube channels does he have? Like he's got like three or four YouTube channels, right? There's Duran Rider. There's Duran Rider's tips. What else is there? Duran Rider's girlfriends. Uh, <laughs> banana. Uh, uh, yeah, he's got he's got a few, I think. But I'm kind of on, I'm on the fence at the moment because. I agree with Hambini, you know, he does, he wouldn't, he wouldn't set fire if he threw petrol in. Um, he can shake most things off and he does <laughs> speak his mind. And I, he does, he, he does, you know, hold the manufacturers accountable when they come out with absolute dog shit. And I quite like that because he's not afraid to speak his mind. He's not afraid to gain some hot water. Um, but yeah, there are certain things that are a little bit, maybe feel a bit uneasy. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm undecided. I'm undecided. But I think he is required in the YouTube space to give balance. And 
you know, you always need someone, you always need people at extremes end of the scales, right? To, to give everyone else a, a space. So you've got shills down one end, naming no names. And the extreme other end of shill is probably Durian Ryder. But is he a shill in his own space? Yes. Um, because he is a preacher. Like, he is not shilling bikes, but he shills his way of life. He shills extremism, so he is a shill as well. So, undecided for me, but Hambini, you, uh, I think this is your topic, so you have the final say, I think. Cool. Fine. Cool. That's it. Harley, if you're watching, let me know if you think you're cool. And put it down below. <laughs> Hey, Harley, if you're watching, you don't have to send me 500 euros. I'll just send you a bottom bracket. Hey! <laughs> extremism. Extremism buys. <laughs> <laughs> Harley, if you're watching, use all 150 of your YouTube accounts to comment below saying Durian Ryder is cool. <laughs> cool. Uh, but no, I think he's a, you know, is it? Like I agree with what you guys said. That he's he's done more good to the to the world than harm. Uh, you know, veganism. I'm not vegan myself. I love a good burger, uh, but I think you know veganism is good for the planet. And so him pushing that is good, of course. Like you guys says, he keeps the industry in check as well. And uh, yeah, I think he's 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 OG when it comes to cycling on YouTube, right? Like even guys like the vegan cyclist. You know, he says he was inspired to start cycling and start making YouTube videos from Durian Rider. So I think uh, a, a world without Durian Rider would be a very different world to what we have today. And uh, yeah, I think uh, it's a better world True. for it. So controversial guy, but I think in, as a whole is a force of good for the world. And uh, uh, but cool or uncool isn't isn't a moral question, right? It's it's just cool or uncool. And some of the, some of the look at those hats he wears. I mean, if if that if that hat is not cool, then I do not know what is cool. Yeah, he has. He, to be fair, he has inspired people just to ride their bikes and thrash the hell out of themselves, and I think that is quite cool. Like yep. to really get fucking fit and like blast themselves up hills. That is cool. He is inspirational, whether you like cool. it or not. Next topic for the cool wall: EVs, electric vehicles. What do we think, lads? Cool, or do we like some <clears> ice <throat> in our life? Hambini. Well, I have. Uh, a Honda Civic, which is the one that looks like it's crashed into an auto parts store and everything stuck to it. Um, but I have also just wired up the garage for an EV. And because of the taxation systems that are being proposed on us from every Tom, Dick and Harry, uh, it looks like the next car is going to have to be an EV. And so I'm going to say, cool, P purely on the premise that it accelerates very fast, and I think the charging infrastructure is getting better. So there's there's that element. But I would also add that the best bike that I've ridden is actually an electric bike because, as PT just alluded to, it gets people riding, even in the rain, even in the wet. If you've just got that electric power to assist you, then it makes a hell of a difference. But, you know, in terms of cars, yeah, that range anxiety still exists. But then again, my Honda Civic will only do... 350 kilometers before it needs to fill up so um that, that's not great so there we go pt what do you drive uh i drive a diesel so that's completely the opposite an old man's EV. car an old diesel yeah so let me put forward my case for evs being seriously uncool you mentioned taxation systems we'll come on to liz truss in a minute i think she's coming up on the cool wall but besides that more that I think is uncool is the smug fucking manner that EV drivers have. And I don't know how this goes across Europe or Asia or whatever, but particularly in the UK, if you drive an EV, you get this little green plaque on your number plate to go, it gives you some sort of elevated status, like I drive an EV, I'm saving the planet, and it's fucking green, right? It should be red or brown or black because EVs are the biggest fucking scandal of lies since Berlusconi's fucking sex parties, right? They are com a complete <laughs> lie to the public. So let's go through. And I've actually got some figures down here in front of me. Wow. EVs are not fucking... EVs... Wow. E and I won't put it in PowerPoint. 
EVs are not green, okay? If, let's take, this is figures made by an EV, there's a papers online made by an EV company called Polestar, and they're basically like Volvo's EV division, right? They take their EV and they rate them in terms of complete CO2 production against an I ICE engine. If you don't know what an ICE engine is, internal combustion engine, so it's petrol or diesel or hydrogen. Um, I mean, EVs definitely aren't cool compared to hydrogen. But moving on, the average EV over its lifetime against an ICE, and if you take in a, like an average um, electricity cost, so like a an average consumption of electricity generated by wind power, coal, solar, tidal energy, over its lifetime, an EV will probably only save you about 15% of CO2 over an internal combustion engine. Now, that sounds good, but when you factor in the elevated cost of, an e of buying the EV, it doesn't sound so appealing. And how many people are actually buying it because they think their CO2 footprint is helping the planet? I beg to differ. I think people are buying them because they think it's cool, which is nothing wrong with that. Um, and it's and it's a bit of a, like a status product at the moment. But in terms of being green and being saving the planet, a complete lie. So it gets worse. That 15% CO2 saving only comes on a, like an end of life EV. So you have to drive the EV for 200,000 kilometers before you hit that 15% saving, right? If you're in a country Ouch. where you get most of the energy from bad things, Germany, you, you don't get that 15% saving. It's actually probably worse off than an ICE engine um, over its full life. And how many people are gonna drive an EV up to 200,000 kilometers? No one is, it's particularly in this country. They're so fucking expensive to buy, people buy them on purchase hire agreement or finance, right? And you're gonna swap that in every 30, 40,000 kilometers for a new one. And every time you swap it in for a new one, another fucking EV is being built somewhere. It's like you, you commission another build and another massive CO2 footprint. So the CO2 footprint of the production of an EV is worse than an ICE because we've been refining the ICE production over the last 100 years. Um, we've pretty much got that nailed. And yeah, people, this is what I don't like. The smug wankers that drive around in their EVs with the little green tick on the number plate, they frown upon me for driving my diesel estate car that's done 120,000 miles. But my CO2 build cost of my car has served like five different owners. So that's way more efficient than someone getting a new EV every 30, 40,000 miles and swapping in for a new one. So it's, it's, complete, it's a complete fucking scandal. It's, 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 a, it's a lie. If you want to be green and save the planet and, and actually have a conscience about your CO2 emissions, buy a high mileage car that's reliable, that has only been built once, right? That, that CO2 cost has only been built once and it's served many, many owners. Buying a new EV and having this high EV turnover is, is horrific. And then, and then there's the, the landfill part of like the batteries. No one wants uh, an, an EV with an old battery, so they change them in. And then every time you change it in, another one is built and the CO2 cost goes up. And yeah, it's just, uh, I think it's a big old Ponzi scheme and a lie. It's all bullshit, but that's the way things are going. So I think EVs are uncool. I, I think... Rant over. I, 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 I think we need to comment about PT's car in being the fifth owner. Think how much uh, fake taxing work's been done before you got it. Yeah, it's got a story to tell. I'm still finding things under the seats. <laughs> And the 26 different sperm samples in the seat. I like my fake taxi car because it's got, it's, it's got basically a map. It's, it's an estate car, so you can fit num like so much bike shit in the back, wheels. It's, it's a perfect car. And it works well as a fake taxi because you can actually stretch out fully in the back. You know, as, that you need a Honda Civic. As many, as many slappers have done at a time. Yes. Uh, I'm going to say, traditionally, I was also a big ICE fan, like like uh, Hambini, former Honda Civic Type R owner here. Like, uh, if if VTEC was on the cool wall today, that's going super super sub zero. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's another another story, right? But I think the coolest thing about EVs is just the acceleration. Yeah, like uh, I, PT valid point about the environmentalism and those smug bastards. But to me, the, the smugness I like is 
you know, a Tesla Model X, you pull up next to some even more smug bastard in a Lamborghini and you can just absolutely leave him for dead. And you've got seven seats and a couple of bikes in the back and whatever else, like, uh, you know, Tesla Model X, the top performance one, a third of the price of the Lamborghini, a uh, mm. hundred times more practical than, than the Lamborghini and you can leave him for dead. At least to a hundred, okay, to, to 200, you might have you, but that's just the coolest thing ever, I think. In, in where we live, Joe, you can't, in the UK, you can't drive fast. There's, there's no way to do that kind of speed or acceleration. You, there's just, there's too much traffic, the roads are shit, you're gonna hit a pothole and get a puncture. <laughs> it's just it's not applicable. And the, the, the journey, like, the, Hambini mentioned it about range anxiety, right? The journeys I do are always long distance motorway miles. And I, uh, it's probably been a long time, Joe, since you've lived in the UK, but have you any memory of what a UK motorway services is actually like? It is the pits of the earth. It's fucking horrendous. I don't want to be in that place to sit and charge my car up for more than one minute. I, like, you just don't want to be there. So having to stop at the motorway, like some of the, you know, some of the journeys I do are way over 200 miles and some of the EVs, maybe pushing it again more than 200 miles. I don't want to be sat there like turning the, the radio off and turning the heater off because I'm worried about my battery dying. And then I might have to sit in the services for 45 minutes, even on a fast charger to top the car up. And the other thing now is everyone, obviously everyone's going to EVs. Do they think that topping those cars up is going to be cheaper? Of course it's not. Like the energy companies still want to make money. They're, to, to, to fast charge an EV on the motorway is getting closer to a full tank of petrol now. The cost is is not. People think it's cheap. It's not cheap to do it to do a fast charger. So then you've got to charge it at home. In the UK, is it is is it the same as America? I think where Tesla superchargers have their own like socket and everyone yeah, else. Yeah, proprietary. Yeah. You see, that's a good thing about yeah. China. China said, "Fuck you, Tesla. You're going to use the same as everyone else." So in in China. Yeah. Uh, one convenient thing is now the infrastructure is really good and you don't have to, you know, look, oh, will my car be able to charge here or not? Uh, mm -hmm. Also, cost of prices in, in China. So my, my wife actually has an EV. I actually want to make a video on it. Like the thing brand new costs like 3,000 British pounds equivalent. <laughs> it's a little box with like 60 horsepower-ish and it's, it's amazing. But to charge that fully costs about one pound twenty. And then she can do 190 kilometers, which is about 110 miles-ish, I think. Uh, so yeah, 12, 12 p, uh, sorry, one pound 20 to do over 100 miles. Like, it makes sense. But from what you're saying, I think it makes I, sense where you live. Yeah, but yeah, here, yeah that's we, the there's like 15 different apps that you need to charge a car. Like, there's, like, there's so many different charging companies. You can't use the Tesla chargers. If you get to a services and you want a fast charger, and some some twats already got it, like, you're fucked. You, you, uh -huh. You're late, you're sitting there. Like, it just does, uh -huh. like, in our country, it just doesn't work. We don't have the infrastructure, and the infrastructure is getting better, but then they're gonna, you know, the ramp the prices up to, to fill your car up. It's not gonna be cheap. You know, the, the energy companies aren't just gonna roll over and say, okay, yeah, we're done with making money, we're just gonna make less now. Yep, I happen. agree. So yeah, I think it, uh, so being cool or not depends on where you live. Like, especially here, I just said the Lamborghini story. Like, we have lots of uh, rich, like, 20-year-old kids who are driving around in daddy's car around here and just being able to pull up alongside them in, a, in an SUV and leave them for, for dust, uh, I think mm. it's, uh, it's pretty cool. For but, me, like, one of, the best, one of the best things about cars for me is the sound. Like, uh -huh. the, the visceral sound of actual, an actual, like, nice engine. I just, I love that. I think yeah, EVs can't okay, let's, that. Okay, let's do this. What's, what's your favorite sounding engine? Uh, the BMW V10 that went in the M5. It was like a V, they had like an M5 Touring, like an estate car that had a V10 in it. That, that sounded amazing. And Beanie, favorite mm. sounding engine? I would go for the Audi five cylinder that they have in the uh, a few of their cars RS three. RS three. Um, so that that's what I would go for. But then I mean the later models they've had to put because of legislation uh, gasoline particulate filters on the engines, yeah. and they've tempted to um, to, to kill the sound. Yeah, yeah. To kill the sound. So the, the when they first well, when they first had the RS three about. 
10 years ago, that sounded a lot better than the current one. It actually yeah. sounded like a quattro, like the rally car. It's, it's so similar, but now it's fucked. It's, it's ruined. I think I'm going to go Lexus LFA. Oh, yes. That's a V10, is it not? It is. Yeah, that's, that sounds like a fucking Vulcan. That, that's amazing, that sound of that. It revs so fast. Like, yeah. yeah. Nice piece of kit. One day. Right, one moving day. off cars. Back, back to cycling. Okay. So, wait. Did we choose where EVs are going? Where do we put EVs? Let's leave them, like... I, 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 I'm allowing you some decide. fudging for being cool in other countries. So, middle of uncool. Hambini. Yeah, I'll go with that. Okay. Middle of uncool. EVs. Potential, but at the moment, EV sorry. lies. Not EVs themselves, but EV lies. Anyway. Okay, the, the next topic, I'm not sure if it is going back to cycling or not, but previous resident of number 10 Downing Street, Liz Truss. How cool is Liz Truss? Well, cool. this isn't going to be a... Uh... You, you've, what the fuck? Cool. She yeah. just like killed everyone's fucking pension, put the economy into free fall, and made it harder for anyone to export. Plus, she's a fucking div. And wow. the people who voted for her, which is like 0.46% of the electorate, got that well and truly fucking wrong, retards. I mean, the Conservative Party, 170,000 members, right? And they all voted for that stupid piece of shit who has got no idea. Everyone told her, even her own economist, that she was going to put the economy into fucking free fall. She decided to go with um, her, her next door neighbour, quasi, and say, we'll do some quasi economics or fancy economics and, you know, let's conduct a science experiment. Well, that went catastrophically wrong. Fucking hell, she's out. She's way, way worse than uncool uh whatever yeah we're not having, i don't even think she should go on the wall she's that that shit right my rant finished well <laughs> lesson in economics from dr hambini fucking hell i mean my pension took a light battering even though i'm only five years old yeah. uh, wiped out 14 percent. fuck's sake I, th I, th I think that s some sort of economic meltdown was gonna happen for the uk anyway I think Liz Truss is cool because she treats number 10 like Airbnb. I think that's quite cool. She literally, did, she literally didn't give a shit, did she? She was like... I mean, it makes Theresa May look like a saint, doesn't she? But um, I don't know. I don't know if the whole, the whole economic meltdown could be blamed on Liz Truss. I think we had it coming. Um, it goes back to like lack of you know, prop, propped up property market and, and lack of supply on the property market side. I think it was always going to crumble. But I like Liz Trust because also her her surname is is an engineering uh, term. So on that basis, uh, that she treated number ten like an Airbnb and has an engineering surname, um, I think she's cool. I I think she's uncool because that's a fucking civil engineering surname. So fuck Ooh. that. <laughs> All right, get her off. There we go. Joe. Well, you have to give her some credit somewhere because she first of all slagged off the Queen when she was, I don't know, 19 or something and said we wanted to be a republic, then went and saw her in her dying days. And then um, other previous sort of highlights are when she became uh, a member of the Conservative Party, she um, was assigned a mentor who she had a fling with. So um, Allegedly. Yeah. She, no, no, it's true. Oh, okay. It's true. He got... Uh, <laughs> he. he, he he got thrown out of the um, Conservative Party and she became Prime Minister. So uh, there you go. E Equality is for you there. So. I, 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 th I think, I think, I think her, her competence is pretty, pretty fucking shit, right? But there is a problem, I think, having lived overseas for quite a lot of my like, career. In the UK, we will just fucking attack anyone and nothing is ever good enough for us in the UK we'll just moan and moan and moan there's too much democracy and every fucking two weeks going forward now we're gonna have someone new because people you know we, we have to bow down to people's feelings so much nowadays that you know if, if there's not instant gratification people get wiped out it's like it reminds me of being a football fan and you know like if the new the new gaffer doesn't get instant results they're just fucking destroyed 
And yes, her, she does not have enough competence, but there is like this attacking philosophy that we have here. And it's, it's like militant, man. Like It's like weight weenies. The UK public is like weight weenies. It's just like nothing's ever good enough, but no one really fucking understands economics because no one's trained in economics. And the, the politicians actually don't, have never probably done like a real job or a real career. A lot of them just go straight into poli politics from fucking Oxford University and they don't actually know what it's like to be a, a normal <laughs> resident of the UK. So like, it's, yeah, it's completely disjointed. I don't know where I'm going with this, just this babbling. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave this one down to you guys because I was taught from a, a young age, don't throw stones in a greenhouse, right? Like, uh, uh, I'm not educated enough to, to, to know what's what's good and what's bad but hambini i mean you're presumably selling quite a few bottom brackets overseas what she's done for the pound and made how how attractive your bottom brackets are to american buyers you should be loving it uh that would be great if I, a i could meet keep up with demand and supply for those things and then oh, b if i wasn't nice manufacturing in the uk yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're yeah, making raw materials in the shed. Raw materials is just way too expensive. I thought you were making them in the shed, like forging them out of your own bauxite stash. No, I get the uh, the stuff from uh, a place in Sheffield, um, the billets and uh, bar. I think it's great that, uh, you know, you two live in a country where you're free to uh, criticise your prime minister anyway. Uh, but I did... That's a, the problem. I did do I did do a bit of Googling, though, and I found a picture of her on a Brompton. So maybe this is related to the fact, where would we put Bromptons on the cool wall? Are, are Bromptons cool or uncool? Uh, they're seriously uncool because I'm getting a dar hole. Oh. Down, down, however you say oh. it, down. Bromptons Have been any Bromptons cool or not cool? Don't even know what you're talking about, so I can't comment. Okay, well, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll leave... So, but where are we going to put it then? Because we've got one sub zero and one uncool. Uh, I think just just leave her as cool then. Sure. She's the jury it's rider true. of what the uh, politics. What the fuck? No way, man. You can't leave her in uncool. She's the jury rider of politics. The whole country she, she will vilify has, us. She has skin thicker than Harley from Jury and Rider, so put her in uncool. Uh, cool. Even those weekend warriors are going to fucking crucify us for leaving her in, in, in cool. Fuck that. Get well, her off the scale. Can, they can fucking stop complaining, get their ass into Downing Street then and, and shut up because the number of people that complain... I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this again. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, to, just to get comments, put her in cool. Okay, so you heard it here first. It might do something for, it might do something for the algorithm, for your video, Joe. Okay, Liz Truss, cool. My next suggestion for the cool wall is, and I've coined a term, guys, nerd fleets. Yes. <laughs> Ow! <laughs> this is the head of the wall. Oh. Fuck. No. I just smashed That's my head up. into the wall. <laughs> that looks oh, beautiful. dear. Fuck is, that, is that drywall or brick? It's solid concrete. Oh, good job, good job. Okay, right, nerd just fleets. Carry, ca carry on, Joe. Carry on. I'm just going to go and get something. Carry on. Okay, nothing out there. Nerd fleets. Okay. Nerdy athletes. Now, what do I mean by this? Like, uh, So I've got two examples. We've got uh, Ronan McLaughlin and Dan Bingo. So athletes who use what they may lack in natural ability and both are... St <laughs> I'm done. There we go. I've got my NHS uh, issue special helmet on. Not sure you're allowed to say that. Just so I don't smash my head against the wall. Yeah, uh, I'll try and keep a straight face. <laughs> so, yeah, nerd fleets, what they may lack in natural genetic ability. And both of those two guys could drop me any day of the week using their genetic ability. I'm not saying their shit. But they do seem to use their brain to take them to levels which their natural athletic ability should wouldn't allow. Yeah, like uh, I think if you run the numbers of someone like Dan Bingham or Ronan McLaughlin, again, both I think they both raced at UCI Conti level on the road. But you know, not they're not. I think maybe they're 
admit it themselves. You know, they're not uh, super, super 0.001% of genetic uh, talent, but using their knowledge and their know-how to squeeze out performance. Now, is that cool or is that uncool? Um, I think it's uh, uncool. Hmm. Ooh. First, first of all, it's Dan Bingham, right? What I, did I, I say? I think he would like me to, to correct. It's not Bingham. But I'm anyway, sorry. Uh, I think it's uncool because you got these like little fat kids now sat at home that don't look up to their idols as being like athletes. They they think they can do it all without actually training. And uh, gone are the days when you had like Rocky Balboa style training, you know, you're in the gym, sweating, working out. And if you weren't, I remember my old rowing coach used to call us fat and we were all like training six days a week. And if you, if you, if you just didn't have the fucking minerals, like you were made to just work harder. And I think that was kind of cool. And it, it, it gives you some sort of discipline to like really train. And obviously, yes, using your brain is, is one way of training, but I think it's uncool. I think people are going to start taking shortcuts and actually forget that they could be training. Okay. And Beanie? I think, I, I think it's uh, uncool as well because it's no longer about the cycling. It, it's become a lesson in aerodynamics. If, yep. if you were going to go for the the world championship of aerodynamics, that's one thing, but this is the world championship of cycling or track cycling or the hour record. And really, I think even the hour record should be set on the same machinery for everybody. But mm. then you get the practical limitation, which is, well, some people are bigger than others. And then it's it's not a, not an easy one to, to govern. If you ask me, the UCI should have stuck to the previous rules and made the, the limitations on the bike a lot tighter so then it just became a human competition and not a lesson in, well, Pinarello have brought out this 3D printed titanium bike that's specifically suited to Filippo Ganna and he's gone and got the world record. It's, 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 it's almost like Formula One. It's, Formula One is the driver and the car, but it's probably more heavily weighted in terms of the car than it is the driver. So the, the car has more effect. And you can see that with Red Bull and Mercedes. Um, they've been the two dominant teams over the past 10 years. So I, I think it's uncool as well. So that's where I'm coming from because it's it should be about physical ability, not about the, the bike. But one thing I'll say, like yeah. with, uh, with Ronan McLaughlin, for example, like, you know, uh, he was taking on people with a lot bigger budgets and you know that was when everything was really at its peak like you know phil guyman was doing his thing and everyone else was also like seeking out sponsorships and big budgets to to try and get this everything world record you know uh, was it was it contador who had a crack at it and stuff you know he had these big names and then i think ronan mclaughlin came along and it was real like david versus goliath stuff you know like he did the maths he worked out that if he makes his bike aero for that steep downhill section, he's going to clock up so much, so much time. And then he'll be able to take back the gap he has from Contador on his uh, what's per kilo or whatever. So I think it's, it kind of, I, I agree with what you're saying that we want to see, you know, man against man, blah, 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 blah. But sometimes when it's man against man, it also turns out into who's got the biggest budget. And I think for someone mm. like Ronan McLaughlin, like if you look at the bike he did it on, it rim brake, of course, uh, it, it, you know, there was nothing on there that was super off the shelf, like 3D printed just for him, titanium, blah, 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 blah. Like he did a bit of grafting himself, a bit of slapping together for a bike. And, uh, you know, it almost reminded me of Graham Al Al Albury. I'm sorry, I'm terrible with names. Yeah, Flying Scotsman back in the day kind of stuff, you know. Uh, using your brain to in 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 increase your athletic performance. So it, sound, it sounds like we can actually separate this in, in, into two scenarios, one where it's cool and one where it's, it's not cool. So if it's underdog doing it, like Dan Bigham, Obri, McLaughlin, it's cool. But when you've got national bodies doing it, it becomes very uncool, I think. So the other day, I think I saw on, on some cycling media thing online that, you know, British Cycling had just opened a new wind tunnel, cycling specific wind tunnel in Manchester. And it just got me thinking, like, hang on, like, track cycling, in most people's minds, is, is an Olympic sport. And Olympics is very human versus human, right? It's, it's more like kind of body composition, your genetics, your blood, your power. It's very kind of raw, kind of 
gladiator-esque competition. And if you think of any other Olympic sports, you know, equipment just doesn't come into it. You know, athletics doesn't really really have any equipment gains like the edges really. Um, you know, rowing, everyone's using the same equipment. That's very like it's all about the athlete. Um, ta tactician wise, it's not really you know there like any other kind of Olympic sport is very pure. It's all about the athlete. And then if you've got national bodies, you know, spending money and time in wind tunnels, yet yeah, like Hambini said, it's just turning into F one. And are, is, the, is the emphasis going to come off training the athletes? Because if you're a full-time athlete and you're, you're training six days a week, if then three days in a week you are required to be in a wind tunnel, your kind of physical training is going to suffer. It has to because there's only a finite amount of time to train in a week. Um, and if you can't, you know, if you're spending three hours, four hours, a week in a wind tunnel that's four hours you're not going to spend training so that's fine but it then but just becomes a money a money and an arms race of aerodynamics and i think cycling is going to stand out and and kind of be separate from the other olympic sports like that by by just becoming all about aerodynamics and i think if it's on national body level i think it's uncool but you know david versus goliath i think it's cool i think it's interesting like the two the two engineering powerhouses of Hambini and Peak Talk, who, who you'd think would be all for the gear and all for the engineering and the technology, are the two guys who most want to see it. Get rid of the technology, get rid of the engineering, and just make it mano mano. Like I think that's uh, pretty interesting. But uh, is it yeah, cool or is it uncool? What do we think? Well, going back to that, if you had a, a contest in designing aerodynamics or designing a bike or designing a bottom bracket or whatever, and you got all the engineers lined up and said, make it to, to be the best, I would uh, I would say that would be cool. So I, I'd, I'd agree with PT and say, cool if it's, uh, you know, man versus man, but uncool if it's, if, if it's, you know, Dave, Dave, well, if it's Goliath, basically, uh -huh, uh -huh. that's what I would say. I think it's cool on the basis that like it's one guy who can do both things, right? Because in theory, any top athlete, like they could have, you know, the best engineers in the world building them a bike, blah, blah, blah. But these three guys who we've just mentioned, you know, Graham Albury, uh, uh, Dan Bingo, Bigham and uh, Ronan McLaughlin, you know, they have the brain and they have the body to do it both themselves. And like, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, the last one, the last topic on the call today, I think will be a bit controversial. It's the sticker on the frame. It's not the UCI sticker. <laughs> it's the made in sticker. Uh, yeah. And on wheels, I believe I've seen it on a few wheel boxes these days. I don't know. Made oh, in yes. somewhere. Loud and proud. Uh, loud and proud. There we go. Designed in so, California. Made in the slums of Charmaine. There we go. Hey, that's there my housing. Talking about. That's your housing estate. Um, I go on. Let's I, go for it. I, I recently had this debate on my channel about uh, some guy taking offence that uh, a product was made in somewhere, and you know maybe a bit contentious that it was actually assembled there and not made there because it was there was debate about where the products were made and how much value is added in the second place, so you can be called it. And there was a big you know debate on 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 one of the videos on my channel. But who actually gives a shit? Like, I think made made in just it doesn't actually matter anymore because there was a time when made in China had negative connotations, right? Um, or made. I mean, there was even a time if you go back to sort of like Hanbini's age or my parents' age, where made in Japan was frowned upon. No one wanted something that said made in Japan on it because if it wasn't made in uk or made in england it was shit but now no one gives a fuck if it's made in china people want their stuff if it's electronics or tech to be made in china if it says made in uk on it and i'm buying a phone or a calculator i'm going to freak out that's going to fucking break like so uh, you know the lowest common denominator used to be made in china right like everyone kind of not everyone but when that came about that was frowned upon whereas now it's it's so good you'd be concerned if it wasn't made in China. So why are we putting on boxes of stuff, things that kind of say it's not made in China? Because there's nothing to be ashamed of about Chinese quality. Like Chinese production is, is really good. We all know it is really good because all of our phones are probably made in China. 
Um, so why are we trying to get around the fact that actually all the components that we're labeling are still made in China? Like, who cares where it's made? If you're, and the, the one of the worst things that, you know, you see is like Apple, like made in, well, it says designed in San Francisco or something and then made in China. It's like, oh, well, at least it's designed somewhere cool and with palm trees and hipsters and stuff. But like, what, what's the fucking point? No one, does that, does that actually have any credence anymore? Like if you say it's not made in China, I just, I just don't get it when someone um, has, has branded on a box like made in somewhere that's not China. Like for, for customs and, and, you know, import reasons, yes, you need to stay the, state the origins of the goods. But when people turn it into a marketing thing, I think it's all a bit weird because, okay, let's say you're, let's just, I'm just going to pick a country out of thin air. This wasn't the case, but let's say it's made in India. If you are, received a box and it had a massive kind of slogan on it like made in india um what why why are you saying it is it because like if you're the founder of the company you m may rightly be proud of the fact that it's made in india but i guarantee no one else gives a shit where it's made like they they rate the product for how it is um so you don't really need to be using it as a marketing tool so i think it it divides people more than it actually helps um, and when people use made in as a, as a marketing thing, I just think it's just weird and divisive. Anyway, what do you guys think? I think you're right to, you know, in certain products. So in electronic products, yes, China, no one gives a shit. But in other things where um, I think people still have some reservations about where stuff is made. So you associate countries with levels of expertise. For example, if you were going to get flood defences, Dutch-made flood defences are probably going to be <laughs> very, very good. Whereas um, if you're going to buy a, a sailing boat that was made in Switzerland or designed in Switzerland, you might be uh, umming and ahhing because uh, Lake Constance isn't that big. So, you know, that, those things historically have, have had some, some things going all, along with it. But in the world of cycling, people still associate certain countries with um poor manufacturing quality and you only have to look through the comments in you know my videos or in your videos or in uh, joe's videos where they say oh this is a, a bike from such and such a place it's a special it's a one-off blah 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 and they're quite negative about it whereas when the western brand comes along and i completely ream the fuck out of it it's like oh the frame's eight years old oh, it, it will have degraded in that time. What a load of fucking shit. It was basically a duffer to start off with and then it's carried on. So, yes, I don't think it actually matters where it's made from an engineering perspective because you're just looking at hard and fast numbers. But in people's minds, they still associate um, certain countries with, with expertise, like German engineering. Well, I work with a load of Germans. They're just as bad as everybody else or as good as everybody else. There isn't, um, you know, one good or, or bad thing there. Um, so I, I think it's cheeky because, you know, we've, we've, I've got some uh, products that say, oh, designed in, uh, in the UK, made in Poland, and then it transpires that it's made in China. So um, that's just, well, it's just a lie, basically, misleading. So, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, yes. if you're if you're if you're if you're a business development and and you're in charge of a marketing department, then my my advice would just be just to don't even go there with the made in thing. Like it's just it's too divisive, and it, what does that what does it bring? You know, it doesn't. I don't think it brings in sales because you made it's made in some way. I don't think. I just think unless you're really single minded and and naive about production, like it, most things are made in China, you can't cover it up. Um, you, you might be able. You, I think. I think the only point of doing it is literally for a customs form. I don't think anyone gives a shit where it's made or assembled or painted. Like some European companies claim their bikes are made in Europe because they're painted in Europe. Big deal. It's because the the value is added in Europe, isn't it? And exactly. that's how they claim so it. If the value, if, if the, I think if the value add is, I don't know if EU law, but I think if the value add is over fifty percent, you can say it's made there. So that gives you an indication of how fucking cheap they're getting the frames for. Because if they're painting it and saying that's over, if that's the predominant value is paint, it shows you how much they're buying the frames for. 
Yeah, so I think this is, you know, lots of the bike companies have been a bit dodgy with uh, where they say things are made. And like you guys say, like, uh, I think there's one thing about it where, you know, a small boutique brand is trying to be proud. I think like in the UK, you have hope, you know, I think they mm. they push it a lot, do they? Like made in the, made in Great Britain, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, Could there is a implic- that's why That's why they've not got any stock. <laughs> that's why the supply, like they can't supply enough stuff. They, they just can't make them. They should, they should make I mean, it somewhere it's, else. Manufacturing in the UK or even in Europe is is very, very difficult. Could get in hold of raw materials. You, yeah. you know, you go into the likes of ThyssenKrupp or Utakumpu to get your bar stock, and it's very, very problematic. Whereas you've got some other bottom bracket manufacturers, let's say in the Far East, who are just churning them out. Mm. Yep. Yeah. I mean, you just cannot compete. Yeah just cannot compete and for those kind of items some people don't care but other people will say well buy a hambini bottom bracket because it, it's made in the uk by this shitty little five-year-old in his garage so um or, or pt's brake adapters it's a um, similar kind of thing yeah like uh, i think like pt said as well uh it's, it does no good it's just very divisive right like it just gets people eyed up. So, like, maybe I'm I'm part of the problem, not solution, because you know the name of my channel is China Cycling. Uh, so, you know, it could be argued that I'm I'm segregating even more. Uh, so maybe I'm part of the problem, not solution. But yeah, like you know, so many comments on my videos if I review something, you know, a Chinese group set or a Chinese list. You know, there's just so many comments about you know, oh, I'd never buy anything from uh, Chinese dogs, and it's like. Uh, what device? <laughs> what device did you write this? Comment? Are you writing that on? <laughs> yeah, like any tablet or computer or phone was probably made in China. So, yeah, there's yeah, this. Yeah. It's it's divisive. It's misleading, and uh, I think does no good for the world. So, yeah, made in stickers I think can fuck off to the uh, the seriously uncool area. Leave them on the custom swarm, and that's it. Right, as we conclude the cool wall, please leave your likes, comments, and all that kind of shit below. And as always, till next time, keep banging your hairdresser. <laughs>